Hi Southway and welcome to today's assembly. I thought today we would look at something a bit different. We're going to be looking at something that's been in the news over the last few weeks, which is space exploration and the International Space Station. Space, the unlimited or incalculable expanse which all matter, objects and events occur. Who understood that? I didn't either. So let's look at it in a slightly different way. Let's think of space as a huge fish tank. So huge that you could not see the sides and you could never reach the sides no matter how long you travelled. A submarine moves through water and the water curves around it. That is the same for planets, stars, space curves around them as they move through space. The universe is made up of space and all of the bodies, planets, stars, moons, asteroids, comets, dust and clouds within it. So some of you would have seen the International Space Station, the IAS, in the news recently. So I thought it would be good to have a look at what it is and learn a little bit more about it. So the International Space Station is the biggest object ever to be flown in space. It travels around the Earth at an average speed of 27,700 kilometres per hour, completing 16 orbits per day. At night, we can see it easily from Earth as it flies 320 kilometres above us. 16 countries, including the USA, Russia, Japan, Canada and many others, work together to build the space station. So if you have not gone out at night to go and see it, you should. On the ISS website, it tells you when it will be above us and so you can spot it travelling through the skies. The International Space Station weighs almost 400 tonnes. That's the same as about 100 elephants. And it covers an area as big as a football pitch. It would have been impossible to build the space station on Earth and then launch it into space into one go. There is no rocket big enough or powerful enough for that. So to get around this problem, the space station was actually taken into space piece by piece and gradually built in orbit, approximately 400 kilometres above us. This assembly, this making of the space station, required more than 40 missions to complete it. So this is a very special year for the International Space Station. This is the 20th year of astronauts living and working there. The first three astronauts moved in on November the 2nd, 2000 and lived and worked there for almost five months. Since then, more than 200 people have visited the station. So the crew that are up there now is called the Expedition 63 crew. They have been on the space station for over a month. So Chris Cassidy, Anatoly Ivanishin and Ivan Wagner arrived at the space station on April the 9th, 2020. So they launched from a country near Russia called Kazakhstan. They went in a Soyuz spacecraft. Every mission needs to have a commander and this time for Expedition 63 it is NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy. So the commander is in charge of the mission. He makes sure it all goes well. So this is his third trip, third visit to the space station. In 2009 for his first trip to space he flew on a space shuttle. He became the 500th person to ever fly in space. So this is what a lot of you will have seen in the news. Two new astronauts arrived on May the 31st to the International Space Station. Robert Benkin and Doug Hurley. They launched in the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. They launched from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. They will stay on the space station for at least a month. Did any of you go out and actually go and have a look to see if you could see the International Space Station and the SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft going through the air. I did, and I managed to spot them both. I wonder how many of you managed to spot them as well. 
So if you watched any coverage on TV of SpaceX mission, you would have heard the words heroic, important, marking a heroic moment. But why is that the case? NASA's SpaceX mission is very important and marked a historic moment. It's the first time that astronauts have flown in the SpaceX Crew Dragon capsule. It is also special because it's the first time in almost nine years that astronauts have launched from the United States to the space station. NASA is working with SpaceX, which is a private company owned by someone you might have heard of, Elon Musk who makes electric cars under the Tesla brand. Doing it this way will save NASA a lot of money with its space programme because it's really, really expensive to send rockets up to space. It was really important as well because this rocket, unlike others, is reusable. So it landed safely again after it had gone to space. This means that NASA does not need to keep building new rockets which are very, very expensive, but can reuse the ones that they already have. So I wonder if you know who this person is. This is Tim Peake. Tim Peake is actually from West Sussex like we are. So he is from a place called Chichester, which is not far away from us at all. So Tim Peake was part of a group of astronauts selected to go to the International Space Station in December 2015. He was the first British astronaut from the European Space Agency to live on the International Space Station. So I thought it'd be good to have a little look at him because he did some really interesting things while he was in space. So while he was on the International Space Station, he experienced many challenges. He experienced living with almost zero gravity, which meant that he floated around with no sensor up or down. He ran the London Marathon on a treadmill in space. He remotely steered an Earth-based robot. He was involved in a three-hour spacewalk and he conducted many experiments and was in touch with schools over the UK. During his time on the International Space Station, Tim missed being with his family and said that one of the things he was looking forward to back on Earth was the feeling of rain which to us might seem a little bit funny, as normally we want the sun, not the rain, but he actually missed the feeling of rain. I thought it would be interesting to watch a little video about Tim Peake and his time on the International Space Station. Tim Peake floating through the Destiny Laboratory here. Major Tim Peake, the first British man to live in space. During his six-month stay, he circled Earth 16 times a day, enjoying a view of our planet that few get to see. The space station is a remarkable place to live and work, uh, and it's you know it's very exciting. You're always being challenged. Um, you're never bored, and and so it's a great place to be. Tim adapted to weightlessness and living on board the International Space Station with ease, brushing his teeth, taking showers, carrying out experiments and even eating scrambled eggs. That about five minutes, it'll be ready to eat. But life was anything but normal for Tim, who became the first brave Brit to complete a spacewalk, venturing outside his temporary home 250 miles above Earth. The spacewalk was definitely probably the, the greatest highlight. Um, but also things like capturing the Dragon spacecraft, the visiting vehicle that I had to capture. Um, that was re a really a very demanding moment, so I, I was really um, very happy to, to do that. He also ran the London Marathon, setting the world record for the fastest race in space and was named in the Queen's birthday honours list. But after six months of flying high, Tim began his journey home, hurtling down through the atmosphere four times faster than the speed of sound. You need to be ready for it. If you're not ready for it, then it will really take you by surprise. It's very loud um, and it's a number of bolts going off, just like a, a heavy machine gun. And actually the, the spacecraft rocks and then kind of you feel it gets thrown, thrown aside. And yes, there's flames come past at, at first because as you start to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, anything that can burn on the outside of the spacecraft will burn. Actually, the windows start to, to burn over and to start to brown over as well. But, you, you know, you're expecting that. You've been told about it. And after that, he was probably hungry, right? The first meal was actually on the aircraft that was bringing me back from Kazakhstan. 
and I was delighted because they had prepared some British tea bags for me. So I had a cup of tea with a little bit of salad, uh, cheese and biscuits. And that's all you actually want because you're still not feeling great. So it was really just kind of simple foods. Um, but to have that first cup of tea on the aircraft was really great. And then afterwards it was, I went for pizza. It's great to be back to see friends and family, but um, you know, I've had a chance to look back at some of the photographs and uh, reflect on the mission and it, it was just truly wonderful experience. And here we've got another video. This time, this is one of his experiments that he did for a primary school while he was in space. So he did some classroom lessons from space and this is one that he did. There are a couple of other things I can do with uh, the water up here. So let me show you, here we go. So I've got a little bubble there, and that bubble of water is going to uh, float away. But I also have with me two bats, which are just like table tennis bats, except these bats are hydrophobic, which means they resist the water, so the water doesn't stick to them. They're like non-sticky bats, which means that you can actually play space ping pong. There you go. We can have games on a Saturday and play space ping pong. Now, something else I'm going to do is I'm going to make this bubble a little bit bigger. I'm going to add some water to it, and then I'm going to put in a fizzy tablet and show you what happens when we put fizzy tablets in water up here. So I've got my uh, fizzy tablet here, and uh, the bubble's nice and close to the camera so I can show you. Here we go. And I'll pop it in. And there you can see the bubble is starting to grow. All of the gas is being released, but all it's doing is it's making that bubble of water get bigger and bigger, and you can see it fizzing up there. After the astronauts' time in space, they then have to return to Earth. So imagine if I was trying to throw a ball from one side of the field to land in a bucket that I had placed on the other side of the school field. Imagine now that that ball represents the space capsule and the bucket represents the space capsule's landing spot on the Earth. So the Suya space capsule that Tim Peake was in started its journey about 400 kilometres above the Earth and it travels at about 28 thousand kilometers per hour and ends its journey to earth at a speed of zero kilometers per hour. The earth is continually turning on its axis as day turns to night and back to day. So if you thought that it'd be hard for me to get that ball into the bucket, imagine how much more complicated and dangerous it is to get a space capsule back from space on time and land in the correct spot. Tim Peake landed back on Earth at 10.16 on the 18th of June 2016. On his return to Earth, Tim Peake said that the journey back was the best ride I've ever been on, adding the smells of Earth are just so strong. Tim was selected as a European astronaut for several reasons. He had the right experience, he had a high level of fitness and the right qualifications. But he also had something else. He had something really important, which is the right attitude. And I think we can learn from this. He was calm, determined, and he worked well with other people. These are all good qualities for us to develop in our own lives. If we're in a sports team or a club, or in fact any aspect of our lives in school, teamwork and determination are essential if we're going to succeed. One of the reasons that Tim Peake went to space was that he wanted to inspire the next generation. He even said what that means is that there is nothing to stop the school kids of Great Britain today being amongst the first men and women to set foot on Mars in the future. How incredible would that be? So could that be you?